Testing, testing, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. clock on the wall says it's just a few minutes after uh, time for us to begin, so I'm going to go ahead and start, and uh, I'd like for us to begin with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you give us. God, I thank you for just a beautiful weekend that you've blessed us with. It is just amazing watching the leaves change, the seasons change. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. God, as we open up Matthew... Give all of us that will be teaching uh, words that reveal the story that you want to reveal to us. Father, be with us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us. Thank you that he's coming back. Father, bless us. Encourage our hearts. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. We are going to be looking at Matthew. And I think it's important for us to understand... Uh, a little bit about the book of Matthew before I give my attempt at trying to read the first 17 verses. And I will tell you, I am going to stumble through it. I had a teacher, Bruce Wilkinson, who uh, one of his seminars on the three chairs, uh, Julie and I were present uh, in Atlanta, uh, one of the suburbs outside of Atlanta. And Bruce quoted... Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 through 16. And at the end, the audience was still just sitting there. Uh, and he did it beautifully. And he said, really? After learning to say all of those names, you're not going to applaud for me? And they, they all broke out into applause. And I've always remembered that he did, a, he did such a good job. And, uh, but then he began to tell us a little bit about what Matthew, the purpose of Matthew You know, we tend to think of Matthew as teaching us about Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And that's great, and that is a true statement. 
But that's not the purpose of Matthew. That's the purpose of John. And when John breaks out, most of you can quote John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14, 1, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The book of John is a theology. And it tells us about Christ. It tells us about His power. It's divided up into three sections. Uh, Matthew also, some will say, and even the study guide that, that Lance provided for us, divides Matthew into three sections. I, I don't see it that way. I see the book of Matthew really divided into two sections uh, because Matthew's purpose and his audience is different. When you look at the book of Mark, the book of Mark is a gospel that is written specifically to the Gentiles, specifically to the Roman world because over and over again in the book of Mark, Jesus is portrayed as the servant of God and as the server of man. And that's the way that Christ is portrayed. Uh, in Luke, uh, it's written to the Greek mind and it goes through and it gives all of the specifics and all of the numbers. Truth of the matter is, as Americans, we think like Greeks. We are very much into the details. How many fish were caught? Well, 153. Okay, that, and that's not a fisherman's count. That's an exact count. If you were to ask Mike Stigmuller how many fish were caught, he'd go, oh, man, I caught way over the limit. And there wouldn't be a number to it. But Luke gives us all of the numbers, and he gives us all of those things that the Greek mind would want. Matthew is a gospel that is written to the Jew. And consequently, when we look at this, genealogy and the genealogy in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke vary a little bit from person to person because the genealogy of Matthew is about Joseph and it goes through that the Jews always went through the male now you're going to see three females listed and we'll I'm going to talk specifically about that and why that happens in the book of Matthew but it's, it goes through the male line because land and genealogy, blood, goes through the male line. You remember the story in the Old Testament where there are no male heirs and Moses has to make a ruling about that family, that the land can stay with those daughters. And so this is important. Also, you're going to notice as I go through here that he ties this genealogy to Abraham and to David. And that's going to make a difference to a Jew. That's going to make no difference to a Roman or to a Greek, is it? They have no tie to that, nor any understanding of that. But in order to be a Jew, you've got to show your lineage back to Abraham, don't you? And the answer is yes, you do. And in order to be a king in Israel, your, your lineage has to go back to David. Which is interesting that it doesn't go back to Saul, who was the first king of the United Kingdom. But it goes back through David, because David is the king of promise. That's all of the way through. And at some point, Messiah, deliverer, and, and by the way, anytime you see the word Christ, that's not his name. That's a title. Uh, Christ is the title of Jesus. Christ is Messiah, Deliverer, okay? And his name is Jesus. It's only Jesus in Greek. In Hebrew, what's his name? What, how did, that same word in, in the Old Testament, how is it translated? Most of you know this, but it's Joshua, the Deliverer of God. That's what the name Yeshua means. The one God chose to deliver his people. That's Joshua. How does Joshua in the Old Testament deliver his people? He's the one that takes them across the Jordan River. He's the one that rules while they are conquering the land that God had promised. Joshua is the deliverer from God for that time period. Jesus is the deliverer of God, Messiah. That's what Jesus Christ means. God's deliverer and Messiah. So when you say when you hear that term Jesus Christ, and especially in the book of Matthew, when you see it uh, because of 1611 and because of King James, 
And truth of the matter is, going back all the way <coughs> to the Latin version uh, of, of the Greek text, Jesus Christ was, because it had become the unspoken name, it's always in capitals that Christ, instead, of, and it won't say Jesus the Messiah, it will say Jesus Christ. But the Greek text always says Jesus the Messiah. And so Christ is a title. It's not his last name. Okay? And I think as a child, I grew up thinking that was his name, Jesus Christ. No, it's Yeshua. And his real name would have been Yeshua ben Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. That would have been how he would have been addressed. And so uh, as, we go through, as we go through the book of Matthew, and I, I, I get the first chapter. As we go through the book of Matthew, I want you to just remember this is intended for a Hebrew audience. And so you need to see the book of Matthew. Not all, not all writings in the New Testament do you do this way. But you need to see the book of Matthew through the eyes of somebody who has studied the Old Testament. Because there's a lot of illusions that take place. And a lot of things take place. And, and Matthew, more than anybody else, will say, and this is to fulfill the prophecy. This is to fulfill the prophecy. That, that's a phrase that's repeated over and over and over again in the book of Matthew because he's just emphasizing the fact that he is Messiah. He is Christ. And he fits all of your check boxes that you legalistic Jews have. I want you to understand Jesus fulfills every one of them. He fulfills every one of them. Now, Matthew, I'm, I'm an early date guy for the book of Matthew. Mark was probably the first gospel written. Matthew is probably the second gospel written. Then Luke and John will be the last of the gospels that's written. And so you'll see uh, parts of Mark almost quoted verbatim in Matthew. He'll use that source. But Matthew versus Mark, Matthew has one great distinction over the book of Luke. And the book of, because Matthew was present during all of the encounters where the disciples were present. And so he writes from his experience, not from the story, not from what he had been told, what's been said, what's been said to him. He will see and he will write. The only other gospel that is that way is John. And John's interesting on in how he writes his gospel because do you remember when Peter and the disciple whom Christ loved go to the temple after the women come back and tell them that they have seen the risen Messiah. And John writes that story in such a way to let you know he won the race to the tomb, but Peter went in first. And, and you like that. If you understand that John is the writer, he still has a little human in him and it still has a little man in him and lets you know about the competition that took place. And so as we read Matthew, I want you to understand Matthew's writing from his own personal experience. And the place that you see it most in the book of Matthew is when Jesus calls the tax collector sitting at the table. Because Matthew's telling you about his answering the call. And so you see that one has a little expanded over the other accounts in that. And so it's really interesting. Uh, doesn't make any difference in how you're going to live tomorrow, but it just... Those are the kind of things that as I read through the book of Matthew that just uh, kind of hit me and, and, and uh, make an impression on me. So I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 17 as best I can. Again, I'm not going to do a great job, but I will do the best I can. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of, of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, 
and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzzah, Uzzah, the father of Jothan, Jothan, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile in Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jehoiakim was father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad. Abiad, the father of Elikim. Elikim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliad. Eliad, the father of Elkazar. Elkazar, the father of Matan. Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Jesus, or to the Christ. Hmm? I just said them so fast you didn't have time to correct them. First thing that I want you to get hold of is a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The word genealogy here is actually better translated as the word Genesis. Okay? It's from the same root. And with all of that being said, and it, it is genosis is the word. With all of that being said, this is the beginning of the story of Christ. Find it interesting. When you, if you have your Bible, just flip open to Luke real fast. And I had it marked earlier. When you find the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke... The starting point and every other point was different, and it's told backwards. It starts from here and goes to, and when you look at the end of chapter 3 in the book of Luke, the genealogy of Christ receding backwards goes back to Adam. The genealogy from Matthew starts at Abraham. Again, we're talking about different audiences. The Greek audience wants to show how he's the son of man. The Matthew gospel, how he's the son of David, son of Abraham. And so we've got two different goals, two different purposes. Okay, Not two different genealogies because one will go to Mary, one goes to, to Joseph. But you've got these genealogies. The other thing that's interesting in the genealogy of Jesus Christ is that there are three women mentioned inside of this genealogy. The first one you may not remember uh, too terribly much. Tamar. What do you remember about Tamar? It's not a great story, but her husband dies and She's supposed to be given, she, the, she's the uh, daughter-in-law of Judah. She's supposed to be given to the son. The son doesn't really worry, spills semen on the ground. But then she's sitting outside, pretends to be a prostitute, when dad goes in, uh, basically, for lack of a better term, uh, to the stock sale. And she becomes pregnant by her father-in-law. And she takes his staff, you remember the story, and whenever it's told that she's pregnant, Judah wants to have her stoned, but she sends with the message this staff so that he knows that he's the one that did this, and he basically says, you're more righteous than I. But 
So keep that in your back of your mind. Tamar is the first. Who's the next one? Rahab. What do you know about Rahab? And by the way, the Hebrew translation of this word is horrible. But again, we're back to 1611. It's the way it had been taught. And so King James insisted upon the maintaining of this word. We know her as Rahab the prostitute. That word literally means innkeeper. Okay? She's, the, she's a hotel manager. Does that mean that she was spotless? Probably not. Because innkeepers at that time, uh, they were bordellos for lack of a better term, okay? Especially on the city walls and for guests. So she was probably impure. So you've got Tamar and Rahab in the lineage of Jesus Christ, listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And the last woman is Mary. And what do you know about Mary? A righteous woman, that's what, that's what the angel will say. She's a righteous woman, but her public reputation was going to be what? Somebody who sex before they got married. She's pregnant. She's not married. These are in the line of Christ. Why does that make a difference for you and I? Book of Matthew, as it talks about Mary and Joseph, are going to be talking about the ones who carry or bring Christ into this world. How perfect do you have to be to bring Christ into the world? Have you ever thought about the fact that you and I are the carriers of Jesus Christ? Basically, we are the Mary to this world. We are the ones who bring and birth Christ to a lost world. Now, after Christmas and all of the eating, some of us may think we're pregnant, but that's not what my point is. The point is going to be, we're the ones that bring it in, and we don't have to be perfect to bring Christ into the world. We don't even have to have a perfect reputation to bring Christ in the world. If we present the gospel in a non-biblical way, then that imperfection gets in the way of our story. But if we present the gospel in, the rede in a redeeming fashion, our imperfection can become a part of the story. Let me explain that for just a minute. And that's not in the notes. It's, this is just out of Tom. The imperfection that I have in my life is the part of my life that Christ has redeemed, isn't it? And if I try to present the gospel in such a way that everybody believes they have to be perfect to accept it, nobody will accept it. But if I let them know, he redeems me because I have been a liar and I have been a thief and I have been impure and my eyes have sought after impurity. And my pride has gotten in the way. Oh, I may not have done what you've done. But I have done what God sees as what separates me from him. And he's redeemed me. And Christ came through imperfect people to create redeemed saints for God that's the purpose that's the purpose and that's the that's what the gospel is isn't it that's the good news of Jesus Christ there's one other woman that's mentioned in the line and that's the wife of Boaz and she's important because she is not of the lineage of Abraham but yet she is the great-grandmother of David, Ruth. He came not only to redeem the sinner and the outcast, but he came also to redeem the foreigner, those who are far away from God. And that's, that's huge. That's huge. 
And that's the story that Matthew wants to tell. Ruth is included on purpose. Ruth is, Ruth is actually, Ruth and Esther are the two books that the Council of Nicaea in the Old Testament were debated on whether or not to include in the canon. Because Ruth tells an uncomfortable story to the Israeli nation, to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish faith. Because for them, impure blood can never be purified. But Ruth tells a different story, doesn't it? In fact, Ruth is more righteous than even Naomi in that story. And Naomi is of pure blood. And so Ruth tells this story. Jonah is the one that was easily included, but also tells a story that God cares for the nations. Because he's sending Jonah to go teach those in Nineveh, the Assyrians, about the redemption of God. And comes back and then chapter 4, you understand that God cares for all and he is trying to teach that lesson not only to Jonah but to the nation so Jesus Christ has come and he's he's at the beginning of Christ the beginning of the story even in his story there are all of these people who have great flaws even women who are the outcast that are included in this lineage because I think even in the genealogy, there's a message for you and I. That he wants to redeem all of mankind and he came for all of mankind. Okay? And then he's going to say this, which just destroys the Greek mind. There were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. If you count this, what he says is right. But there's this huge 70 year gap in Babylon where there's no accounting. Why 14, 14, and 14? How many tribes were there? And how many, well, let me do it this way how many sons of Jacob are there? 12. And sons of Joseph that became Israel. Two. So he's saying all from, he's, he's making reference to this all of the people of God. All of the people of God. And all of the people of God. To the Jewish mind, when something is said three times, what does that mean? It is unchangeably set. He came for all of his people. Christ came for all of his people from Abraham. So introduction of one more phrase that you're going to see in the book of Matthew. The kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of Israel. And those, by the way, are not interchangeable. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Israel. He's going to be talking about, all, he came for all of Israel. And who is Israel? Well, the Jewish mind is going to say those with the blood of Abraham. Or who have sort of come to the blood of Abraham. Proselytizing. What's the kingdom of God? And that's where you get into, this is... Uh, what is a kingdom? A kingdom is a territory ruled by a king. And so the kingdom of God would be what? All of the territory ruled by God. So in the book of Matthew, whenever we come across that little phrase that says the kingdom of God, that includes us. Because if we are ruled by God, we are a part of the kingdom of God. We have placed ourselves under his kingdom. Okay? Kingdom of heaven, heaven is a territory. It's a, it's a land mass. Just like Israel, the king of Israel, that's a land mass. But the kingdom of God is an influence, is an influence kingdom. 
Okay, and so the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God are two different things, but the kingdom of heaven is specifically the territory that belongs to God. This kingdom of God is the influence that is under the submission of God. So you can be in the kingdom of you could be in the kingdom of God while you are in Assyria, while David was in Babylon. I'm sorry, while Daniel was in Babylon, he was still under the kingdom of God, but he was not in the kingdom of Israel. Okay, that's just for me and commentaries to fight over. So now let's look at, let's look at verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they became together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. He didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will give birth to a child and will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. So Mary is young. So I'm gonna, I want to give I want to share with you some marriage customs of the first century. Mary is probably a young lady between the ages of 12 and 15. Okay? She has had at least three cycles that have already begun to take place. And at the beginning, when a, when a young woman has her first period or goes through her first cycle, there's a little ceremony that takes place. And in the home, the women of the home gather together. They take the clothes that she had been wearing where blood had stained them and they burned those clothes. From that day forward, she is not allowed to play outside of the home with the children. She moves from being a child to a woman. And she begins to learn what it means to be a homemaker or a home, someone who cares for the home. Now, she may still be with the children, but she is the one who cares for the children. She's not cared for anymore. She's the, now the caregiver to those children. And so she begins learning that trade of being one who keeps the home. And so she makes this movement from here to there, and her garments are even changed. She's no longer allowed to wear the child's robe. She now wears and dresses as a woman, which means she even has to wear the head covering. And so she moves from being a child to a woman. With that, she is now eligible for the yenta, for the matchmaker, to be approached, uh, for them to approach her parents. And her father will make the arrangement for the marriage. And so another thing that she is taught during this period of time is she is taught how to love her husband whenever she has one. She's taught how to love her husband. Marriage in the first century, whenever you would find the phrase that says, and he loved her, that's, all, that's almost like, and here's an extra blessing. Because love was not the basis of marriage. We know from the book of Malachi that the basis of marriage was to produce godly offspring. And if love is in the home, that's an extra blessing. But marriage was not, love was not usually based upon 
that ephemeral emotion of love. You hope it develops, and by that I mean eros, not phileo. They should be friends, but eros, they, this, this, this love match. In fact, sometimes the first time that the woman would see the man that she was going to be married was when she was standing under the chapa, under the canopy at the marriage ceremony. That might be the first time she sees her husband because oftentimes they would, the marriage would be made from somebody from a different community. Here's why that would take place because almost everybody in that community was related. So unless you were marrying your cousin, you usually married somebody from another town, especially a little place like Nazareth. Nazareth was just a little village, okay? Capernaum was just a little village at the time. You know, not more than three, four, five hundred people. And almost all of them were related. And so a lot of marriages took place from a different community. Just learn a lesson. Don't put my hand in my pocket while I'm preaching this morning. So, um, so here's this man, Joseph, who apparently is also from Nazareth, which is very unique in a first century marriage. And Joseph, we have no idea his age. He's at least 15 because after your 13th birthday, whenever you go through your bar mitzvah and you are able to quote large sections of scripture from the Torah, and you would do that to the satisfaction uh, of the priest of your synagogue or of the temple, and you would quote, and, and then you would have to read sections. And by the way, they still do that today. If you ever get to go to Israel, uh, hopefully you're there on a Thursday, and you get to go to the the Western Wall, because that's when they'll do, and they'll have big bar mitzvah parties there, and the boy will come out, and they'll be bringing the, the scroll of the Torah, and they'll open it up, and with, you don't touch the page of the Torah with the pointer, they would, be, they would read the Hebrew text out loud for anyone to hear, just to prove that they are able to read the law. Typically, they would read from Exodus 20, and they'll read the ten, what we call the Ten Commandments, what they call the Covenant. And they'll read that section of Scripture. Well, that takes place usually in the age of 13 or 14. From time to time, it takes place at 12. And apparently, it took place with Jesus at the age of 12. And that would have been why he went to the temple and stayed there with it. He had, he had just gone through that ceremony and he was reading the law and now he's explaining the law to them. And so but sometime between the age of 12 and 15, he would go through that and he would also take off his ch children's clothes. And from that point forward, he would dress as a man. Modern day Israel, especially with uh, the very ultra conservative Jews, they would take off their children's clothes and now they would begin to wear, I call them the black hats. He would begin to wear the black hat, okay? And his, uh, um, uh, yarmulke would also be black. It would put it on, it would be easily visible to show that he is no longer a child, he's a man. At the age of, by the age of 15, you enter into an apprenticeship. And you almost always entered into the apprenticeship of your father. So a family that were carpenters would produce carpenters. So it's every reason to believe that Joseph's father was also a carpenter. We know Joseph was going to be a carpenter because he's called the son of a carpenter. Jesus is called the son of a carpenter. And so uh, Joseph is, would enter into his apprenticeship. Now, this engagement that they had typically lasted between 18 and 12 months, or 12 to 18 months. During that time, what Mary was to be doing was not only learning what it means to be the keeper of a home, but she was also to be making her wedding gown, her wedding, the apparel that she would wear when she stood under the ch chapa. And she was the one who was to make it. Not her mother, not a seamstress. She is to be the one that makes it. Now she can buy material, but she is to be the one that makes it. 
So that by the time that Matthew tells the parable of the wedding feast, and the Jews all understand this, but maybe this will make this parable make more sense to you. Um, what takes place is on an unannounced day, the bride doesn't know. The bride does not know when her wedding day is. I want you to grab hold of that. There's no invitation sent out. The bride doesn't know. The groom is coming from the other town and he sends a forerunner ahead. Are you seeing pictures that the Jews would get that are in the book of Matthew when they talk about John as the forerunner and, and all this? They would send a forerunner ahead and his job is to go down and say, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And then he goes to the bride's house, knocks on the door, says, the bridegroom is coming. What she is to do is to put on her wedding garment and she is to stand in the door until the groom comes. Typically, he doesn't come until the sun sets. Uh, he may come earlier. And when he comes, he goes and he gets his bride. They go and they stand in the town plaza under the shapa. And they go through the ceremony. The ceremony is symbolized by the wrapping of the wrist with a silk ribbon. Holding hands, silk ribbon. Why a silk ribbon? Silk is almost impossible to break. The covenant that they are making is almost should be impossible to break. And then they take the wine. He drinks from the wine. And then he shatters the glass wrapped inside of a cloth. Why does he shatter the glass? Because it is as hard to go back to your former way of life as it is to re as to put this glass back together. So I am saying goodbye to my old life, hello to my new life, which is bound together with this unbreakable bond. Then they go, there's a feast. The feast will last anywhere from three to seven days. During the process of the feast, the husband and wife go up, consummate the marriage. That choppa that they stood underneath is used as the bed covering. And when the blood is spilt from the first act of intercourse, that blood, that chapa is then hung outside of the wedding window so that all can see it was a pure wedding. Now, so here's the lesson that I want to teach for you guys. And I, I, I go through all of that. And if you want to know more about that, Kay Author has a book called An Everlasting Love that is worth reading. It's a short story book, um, but it's a, it's a book worth reading. I say all that to say this, and here's the lesson I want to teach. It's not the lesson in, the, in this right here. But you get the idea. You've, you've seen where we've come and that Jesus is here and that there's, he's a fulfillment of prophecy. Mary and Joseph are righteous people. The line of Christ doesn't, always, doesn't have to always come through people that are perfectly pure. There's flaws in this, in this genealogy. But when you think about this wedding that takes place between Joseph and Mary, between Christ and his church, those who enter in to covenant relationship with Christ, are they pure? And the answer is no. Every one of us is a sinner. And so consequently, in order for there to be blood on the chapa, where does the blood that seals and consecrates that wedding come from? It would come from a husband that would cut himself and put the blood on there to show that I take you as pure. And that chapa is folded up, given to the bride's family as a seal that says this is a pure marriage. When Christ takes us, whose blood is on the chapa? It's not mine, because I wasn't pure. But it's his, because his love is great enough to forgive me for my impurity and to be Jesus Christ, the one who saves me, Messiah. That's what the story of Matthew is going to tell us. The story of one 
who redeems us, even though we are not pure ourselves. Okay? So that's our introduction to the book of Matthew. Next week, I think Bill Gressett is teaching. Mario is teaching. Okay. And so Mario will be teaching next week. And uh, I hope that you...